join me in welcoming Rudy, Peter, and Bjorn to the stage, and I apologize if I butchered your last name. All right, thank you, and good morning. So we're gonna ha have a good discussion this morning uh, talking about smart glasses and what are the challenges to widespread adoption. Uh, we're gonna look at some survey results that uh, a project that Peter and I had actually worked on last year. Uh, and, and you know, Bjorn will be providing his views as well from a use case and a user experience. Um, just to kind of give a little bit of background on where this came from, uh, so I, as Tom mentioned, I'm with the IEEE, which is a large engineering professional organization. And we started an initiative last year looking at smart glasses in general. Uh, a couple of things we did, we did some workshops. Uh, I mentioned we did this survey. I'll talk a little bit about some of those issues that came up uh, as a part of those activities. And then we'll get into a little bit of a dialogue on it as well. Uh, some of the slides will be a little bit busy. I'll try to just hit the highlights and then we'll actually talk a little bit more in depth about it. Uh, so as I mentioned, what are really the issues and uh, you know, where are the gaps that are out there? You know, what is actually preventing you know, the wider spread adoption? That's what we were trying to understand. Now me, from a personal role at the IEEE, I work a lot with standards. So you know, if we think about uh, some of the work that we've done before, we think about Wi-Fi and Ethernet, there's always been standards and specifications that have really driven interoperability, compatibility between devices and protocols. Uh, so you know, we've started looking at, well, what's the next generation of standards around AR or VR or any of the devices that are out there? So we're trying to get a handle on that. And you know, then, of course, it always comes up, but what are really the use cases that are going to actually drive adoption as well? And looking at what are the recommendations and what are the solutions that we can actually be providing amongst you know, the community at large to try to get adoption to move more quickly. So one of the things we looked at uh, very early on is uh, the different markets and the different priorities. And we found a tremendous variety of issues that people would bring up, and they varied quite a bit between market. So you know, industrial applications would be looking at one thing. Consumers would have different concerns. Uh, also extended that to look at different professional services-oriented applications and even military first responder, uh, more ruggedized type of equipment. What are people looking for in smart glasses from that perspective? So some of the workshops we did, we did a few industrial workshops, which were rather interesting. Um, you know, certainly things would come out uh, even beyond the technology and uh, beyond other issues. Uh, just the environment, a industrial environment. Uh, one of the workshops we did was on electric utilities. Electric utilities tend to be a very conservative industry. And I think the first <coughs> hour of the workshop that we did, it was mostly, why do I need this? What good is, are these things gonna do for me? The more time you spend with them, they start saying, ah, oh, yeah, I could see this for you know, looking at where underground utility lines might run as opposed to looking at a map. You know, they start getting ideas. Um, but in some of the conservative industries that you talk to, you find that it's very challenging to actually to get them to understand because they're, not, they're very slow very often to adopt uh, some of these new technologies. Uh, there's always the issues that come up with integration with legacy systems. Uh, one of the things I thought we found interesting looking at the consumer interests versus the industry interests was uh, an industry was perhaps a little bit less concerned with the original capital cost of devices. They were a little bit more concerned with the ongoing uh, you know, maintenance and operations costs when it came, what do I have to do with my infrastructure to get these things to work for my environment or uh, you know, just you know, trying to figure out what is different and what's new in terms of their ongoing cost. And will they change over time and will I need to buy new devices? So they were, industry was looking more at the long-term cost. Consumers tend to be looking at, you know, you know, is this you know, cheap? I can buy it, I can have fun with it. So you get, really get a lot of different variety there. Uh, there was a lot of issues that came up around safety considerations, particularly uh, in industry and just an interest in return on investment. What's the use case? How do I know that I can actually justify my expenses? So as I mentioned, we did this survey as well. Uh, a couple of the key takeaways, uh, there seemed to be more people who were looking at the adoption of smart glasses as being slower than expected. Uh, you know, not so many of them look saying, yes, it's going you know, much faster than I expected. And I think that was largely part, uh, if you look at the third bullet that was on there, that the respondents that we had on the survey seem to be skewed uh, for very small companies and very large companies. So I think that will tend to be, you've got a lot of people who are you know, kind of new entrants, you know, the, the startups that have gotten into the AR space uh, and smart glasses space. 
um, you know, they're very enthusiastic. So, you know, they want it to go faster and maybe it's not going fast enough. The large companies maybe have heard some promise about it, uh, you know, in, in terms of how they're going to adopt it within their industries. So that would tend to go a little bit slower in their minds as well. And we also found that uh, many of the hurdles uh, were not always technology related. Uh, you know, there's a lot of non-technical issues that were coming up as well. Boy, this clock goes fast when you're up here. <laughs> so um, familiarity with smart glasses. I'm going to hit these five charts that I have very quickly so we can move on uh, to our next topic. Uh, most of the people were very familiar with smart glasses. I mean, that was one thing we were concerned about when we did the survey, you know, what's the level of uh, knowledge that people respondent would have. And so for the most part, I think we had a very knowledgeable audience in terms of the respondents that we got. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the attitude towards adoption, you know, a little bit more people feeling it was a little bit slow as opposed to uh, those moving more quickly. And I think you'll get these slides so you can read all these gory details. But, you know, here's a couple of interesting ones. Uh, so what were the hurdles to adoption? The highest rated category was battery life um, and, and price. So these are not, you know, the, you know, what's really interesting technologically, you know, like, you know, advances in the, uh, in the different features of, a, of smart glasses, but they were like really basic things that people were citing as adoption hurdles that were out there. I actually found interesting that towards the bottom, privacy was one of the low ones. You know, you hear a lot of things in the media and people were concerned about, you know, what does it mean to privacy? But amongst the folks who actually responded to the survey, that was on the low end of the scale here in terms of concerns. Uh, so looking at the buying criteria, cost. Cost was, uh, you know, the top uh, answer that we got. And again, size and weight. I know Peter had a few thoughts on this uh, from his own experiences that we'll get into. Uh, but in terms of user comfort, that was actually one of the, the highlights that, was, that came up. Uh, you know, so again, these are not like super you know, feature-rich type issues. These are like really basic things that what makes people comfortable in terms of using smart glasses for, and getting them to buy them and use them uh, regularly. Uh, looking at some of the features that were interested, uh, interesting to people, uh, the, the, uh, the second screen information was really, you know, what they were looking for. You know, we've got a whole litany of things. I'm not going to go into those because we're going to cover these in discussion. Um, but it's kind of interesting to look at how these things scale all the way down that, uh, you know, smart eyewear for virtual reality based gaming was down on the low end and, uh, you know, people really looking at training, work order transaction as being the, the high runners. So, at this point, I'm going to actually turn it over to Peter. Peter's going to talk a little bit more. I, I actually I have to give some credit. Peter actually authored the majority of the survey that we did. Uh, you know, we kind of changed it around a little bit, uh, but you know, Peter did the lion's share of the work. So he's actually going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the specifics of the smart glasses that came into the discussion. Thanks, Rudy. Good morning, everyone. I will uh, immediately switch first to this slide. Uh, what we did is, uh, okay, when we're talking smart glasses, there are a lot of animals in that family. So like with ordinary glasses, we distinguish between reading glasses, between correction glasses like mine, ski goggles, uh, sunglasses, these are all different types of glasses. And what we wanted to do is classify also the world of smart glasses. And the only classification that makes sense, and it's not the only classification that makes sense, but at least a primary sense is driven by the one that puts on the glass. What is the perspective of the wearer? And that's what you see here. The first thing is a, what we call a glass camera. It's a GoPro, let's say, embedded into a frame of, uh, into a pair of glasses. It doesn't give you any information, it just streams what your eyes are seeing to the rest of the world. When you're driving down a canyon, you're not interested to get a mail. When you're performing surgery, you're not interested for a party invitation. You want to concentrate on your work, have your field of view clear, but it might be interesting to stream what your eyes are seeing to your students or to your fellow uh, mates that are watching your breathtaking rides on YouTube. The second thing is uh, what we call a smart rear mirror. This is comparable with the rear view mirror in your car. It's always there, but you're not looking at it. You're maybe looking 60 seconds during one hour driving, 
but it's crucial at certain points in time when you make a maneuver, you just glance to that rear view mirror and you say, okay, now, no, I won't make that uh, overtaking. I'll, I'll wait for a, f a few seconds. Well, that's exactly what this rear view mirror type of glass does, and Google Glass is the most famous one. Uh, Vuzix is another example. Uh, it is a display in the corner of your field of view, but your focus is still principally or mainly on reality in front of you. Then you have uh, the third category, which is a smart monocular. Now your field of view, at least one, is obstructed, I could say, with a optical engine that you have to look through. And the big advantage of the fact that your eye is looking through the optical engine is the fact that we can overlay on what your eye is seeing a digital extra information. This is the true augmented reality. The previous one is informed reality, just what you see with an extra information hands-free. Now we're talking real augmented reality. Monoculars is like Lumus, OptinVent, and there are several ones. And then we move, rather than one eye, two eyes, we go to the binocular, smart binocular. Both your eyes are looking through the optical engine. Both your eyes get an overlay of digital information. We are talking the really true augmented reality, uh, or, or augmenting uh, the real reality that your eyes are seeing. And then the other extreme is the, the sorry, for the, the binoculars, we have the Epson, you have the ODG, you have the HoloLens falls in that category, all these devices. And the last one is virtual reality. Now your eyes, your eyes are completely shut off from reality and you're fully immersed in a virtual world. Talking Oculus, talking the Samsung and other virtual reality goggles. Now the point is this. This is probably the single slide, uh, important slide that, that I want to explain is this. On the horizontal X, we express your enrichment of the natural view. How much feeding of your brains with digital information on top of what your eyes are naturally seeing. And on the vertical X, we get the vigilance of the world surrounding you. How much of the world are you still seeing? Now with the extreme uh, end of the immersed or the virtual reality, you don't see anything of the real world. So we are vertically spoken at level zero. You're completely shut off. But your, uh, your brains are fully immersed, enriched by what this digital world is telling you. So that's the maximum you can go. At the other side of the spectrum, you have the GoPro embedded in a camera without a display, just cameras that stream what your eyes are streaming. That is full vigilance of the world. No cognitive load whatsoever. You're just watching what you need to see in front of you. But immerse, uh, feeding your brains is zero because no information is added to what your eyes are seeing. And so you move from the glass camera to the uh, virtual reality goggles. You sled, uh, gradually go down in terms of vigilance of the world surrounding you and you increase in terms of what your brains get as, as additional information from the digital world. And what the first slide is telling you is that people in enterprise, and this is my key message, people in enterprise believe that for most activities in enterprise, you need to watch what's happening, you need to watch what is happening around you. You need, for a safe, from a safety point of view, your eyes on the machine, on whatever is surrounding you. And so most transactions will not allow you to wear virtual reality goggles. That's okay for training, that's okay for education, but it's not to perform an activity. Glass cameras and informed reality are most suited to focus on the reality. Of course, when we're talking training, education, the value of augmented reality goes up spectacularly because your brains get additional information. And that was also confirmed by uh, that first slide uh, by the survey. And let me, so most of the transactional deskless workers means not 
during education, not during training, most of the activity, when people are working, uh, most of their working activities, they have two use cases. You tell me what to do because you're able to see what I see through these cameras from a remote control room, or step by step, I get guidance, I get information to do my job better. And this is deskless workers. When I'm talking training, education, it's a different ball game. Then we can talk about true augmented reality and virtual reality. And what you need depends, and that's my, li my last statement, what you need depends heavily on, are you in oil and gas? You need an ATEX certified device. For now, no, no technology available that meets that requirement. So you, you, it's hard to make a general statement, I would say. It really depends on where you are, quality, maintenance, in what kind of an industry, for what kind of a process and purpose that we are talking. Sorry. Ah, we can okay, skip that. Ah. Hi. Good, mon good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks, for, uh, thanks to Ori and his team for organizing this nice event. Um, it's quite good, quite interesting. I'm Björn from uh, AR Experts. Um, we've got two USPs. Uh, one is we are doing augmented reality since over a decade and having established industrial solutions with augmented reality. And another thing is we believe in the incredible potential of augmented reality. Someone else? Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> probably I can convince you. Um, so what we believe is that uh, in the future, not tomorrow, but in the future, there will be uh, every second workspace equipped with augmented reality systems. I will give you uh, some reasoning for it. Uh, this is uh, what you see as the production data of the Golf. Golf is probably one of the most sold cars ever. And what you see here is um, the dark bar shows you uh, the unit numbers having produced of the car, and the other bar shows you how many cars have been, been produced uh, over which period of years it has been produced. What you see is the first Golf was produced over nine years, and about uh, seven million units have been uh, produced. And what you see for the Golf 6, it was produced only five years, and only three million units. So with the same amount of, uh, with the same facilities, they were being used uh, 30 years ago for nine years, and now they're getting used for three years, and only, or for five years, and only for three million cars. So um, that's a big problem because it's a big invest in, into it because of all the flexibility, et cetera, they need. And that's why Volkswagen is currently not earning money with the Golf. Um, and at the same time, when you produce less cars with the same machines, you need to be more flexible. But what the car makers, uh, because what the car makers are currently doing is they're bringing more and more niche products to the markets because they are acting in saturated markets. And what you do is you need to have a better niche product. So, the amount of cars getting to, uh, uh, to the market by German car makers doubles almost from 2006 to 2020. So at the same time, we're using the same facilities, uh, we need to be more flexible. That's a big problem. Um, but what can you do? Uh, so what's currently happening is that you automize what, is, what can be standardized. So you try to automize 80% of the job, and you try to be flexible with 20% of the job. And what is the biggest thing, what's the best thing to be flexible? It's us, it's human beings. But that we are flexible and can do things and can do things in the right quality, we need to have right information. We need to have right information at the right time at the right location. That's basically augmented reality, right? Those are the superpowers we're talking about. But why are we not yet there? So let's do one step back, let's go to real reality. Yeah, real reality is our planet, it's nice, yet uh, it's augmented reality without augmented. So, real reality. It's our planet. It had 4.6 billion times for development. It was an iterative trial and error process. It's quite cool. It's, I think I love the Earth. It's quite a nice place. It's quite a cool result. We are, can do a lot of things. We've got some troubles like wars or Donald Trump. But besides that, it's quite nice. So, but now we want to extend it. We want to make this perfect place a better place. If you stick to this metaphor, you realize well, we are working since 40 years on augmented reality, but we are not yet there. Um, but how are we going to get there? Uh, we did also a kind of classification. Um, 
We will start, you see um, from left to right, it's a timeline how we are going to get there. The first will be smart glasses, and there are currently things where smart glasses are already successful. They are increasing. Um, and smart glasses is nothing more than an involvement. We have big computers, smaller computers, laptops, smartphones. Now we've got mobile information. It's good. It helps us. The use cases for augmented reality are getting bigger as soon as we can add some more quality information. And um, that's something we call quality augmented reality. It's real augmented reality, but it's not as accurate. If you think in terms of, um, um, so it's inaccurate positioning system, like you see here, it's a logistic application. It tells you out of which box in a warehouse you need to pick stuff. Um, it's enough information to show you, if you think from the point of assembly tasks, in which hole you need to put a screw. It's more process security, but with some positional context. And what you see on the right in this black one, which I wrote to be done, which was not yet realized, is accurate augmented reality. It's, if you deal in industrial context and you're showing information, for example, for drilling a hole at the right location, it's not like you cannot simply like, uh, yeah, it's augmented reality, we have this tracking, you all know this jittering demos. It needs to be accurate and certifiable. It's not like it's kind of accurate, it needs to be certifiable. There's measurement technology involved. That's enough information for drilling holes. That's where we see augmented reality will come to the industry. Uh, on the other side, we see uh, it's still problematic to work augmented reality for eight hours, and there will be use cases starting now which are like they use the system for one or two hours a day or maybe only half an hour a day. Those are hard care use cases. Um, that will be involved some time until we add the time for full work shifts. I will um, just put my last... Ah, I got back. I oh, like here. Um, I just put this slide at some uh, for the technology guys between you. I won't explain this, but this is part of the complex problems we haven't yet solved with augmented reality to be accurate. There's so many things and so many technical things, and then there's like, I talked about measurement technology. Um, you need always measurement guys to do measurement technology, but when you want to show information to someone, it's a user, it's not a measurement guy. So also this complex measurement technology needs to be made somewhat easy. And there are a lot of other things, if you move your H and B, et cetera. But we can discuss it later after the panel with, it's a techie discussion. So, um, uh, again, wrong. So thank you very much. Let's start to, to discuss. Okay, we're going to, uh, we have a few questions that we had talked about uh, bringing up, and then we're also going to open it up to the audience as well. So the first question that I was going to pose uh, to both Bjorn and Peter was, if you think about you know, different technologies and the way they tend to get adopted, uh, whatever they may be, do you think the consumers will actually be the driver to bring smart glasses devices into industry, or will industry adoption be the driver to bring consumers to use smart glasses? And uh, I know it's a multi-dimension question, <laughs> Uh, but let me, uh, I'll go to Bjorn first on this one. Um, I mean, it's a good question. We've seen uh, uh, things in the past, or what was currently happening is that augmented reality was driven by the industry uh, for like the last 30 years. And now the last five years, it's driven by the consumer market. And we're doing so many big steps currently. If you look at the Microsoft HoloLens, what happened with the tracking technology, it's like it was driven by the consumer market. But now everybody realizes, okay, as a consumer, I'm not yet going to wear, or also in two years, one of the solar lenses, meter devices, uh, I could do it for fun, yeah. But I'm not going to spend 1,000 bucks on it. Yeah, and I know. It's, oh. <laughs> right? Uh, right, and I was going to say, when we were talking earlier, Peter brought up some interesting points, too, in terms of you know, adoption of like, virtual reality versus augmented reality and the way we're going to see things evolve in yeah. that sense. Yeah, you know, you see a switch back to the industrial market. It's because you've got use cases there where you can earn money with it. You can concentrate it there. But we wouldn't be there without the in-between push of the consumer market. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also what you see if you look at uh, 3D systems. It's a big uh, 3D printer manufacturer. They, three years ago, they, they put um, uh, um, cheap consumer printers for 100, 200 euros to the market. Also, the user said, okay, it's not the quality I actually want. And uh, they now stopped 
but falls at consumer business and switched back to industrial markets. Peter? Uh, it, I think it depends a little bit on the class, on the class we're talking. For virtual reality, I think that uh, consumers might be driving because for the sake of the, the big numbers, the volume that they can sell to consumers, it might drive down the price and, and that might and, and drive up the technology and the capabilities. And that might uh, drive that uh, adoption curve. While maybe the first ones to uh, acknowledge might be industry for training, but the real volume is, uh, is aimed to be uh, driven by consumers. While on the uh, informed reality, like the Google Glass, uh, Recanjet, there, I would say, in general, adoption is, according to me, probably going to be driven by uh, enterprise, with the exception of a couple of niche domains like skiing and cycling, where you have the, the Recanjet example. Uh, for the true augmented reality, um, I would say that it's undecided. Maybe industry is going to drive it, uh, maybe consumer, but it's all going to depend on the quality and the breakthroughs in terms of technology that we still need to, uh, to really uh, be fully. We're all convinced about the added value. We're all convinced about the business case. But when you wear it, it's not meeting all of our expectations yet, I would say. So another interesting question that we were having a discussion on earlier today was technology factors versus human factors. And you know, when, when you come to a conference like this, um, you know, and see many of the companies that are downstairs exhibiting, uh, you know, this is very much a technology-focused group. And sometimes you know, it becomes easy to lose sight of uh, some of the, the human drivers that are behind getting people to actually wear smart glasses and use them in their daily life or in their jobs on a daily basis. Uh, I know some of the workshops that we've done, uh, it was very interesting to me, one of the first things that came up in uh, an industrial workshop was worries about what uh, unions and trade organizations, how, how they would feel about the impact on their jobs, how it would impact their workers. Uh, so. You know, it's something I hadn't really thought about. I'm thinking about you know, how this device would be feature rich and actually be beneficial to the job and return on investment. But they were more worried about you know, the, the perceptions of the workers who are going to be wearing them on a daily basis. So I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on some of those issues as well. So I'll start this one with Peter. OK, on the consumer side, I'm convinced it's a, a thing on your nose. So it's a personal statement. So it's a lot about fashion. And, and acceptance by peers. While on the enterprise side, it's function. It's not fashion, it's function. But one of the big hurdles and, 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 and concerns that we have uh, from a functional point of view is how wearable are these glasses? Uh, is it comfortable to wear? Can you work with that for eight hours? Uh, is it safe? Is it a safety shield? Because in some environments, you need a safety shield. So that is... Uh, more at that side. Um, I see different challenges there for, for um, adapting it. It's, it's, um, so one challenge is the technology, as we are saying. Yeah? There's technology which is not yet ready, which is its obstacles. But it's not as you, you have figured out in your slides. It's not the battery life, for example. It's, um, you know, uh, who's playing Pokemon Go? Or at least has tried it. So what is happening? What is Pokemon Go doing with your cell phone? It sucks your battery. And we're also using smartphones. We used the Nokia cell phones lasting for one week. Um, but we found solutions for it. We are dealing with it because it solves our, uh, our pains and our gains. And for Pokemon Go, what happened? Everybody bought a battery pack. Yeah, we are finding solutions for that. That's one part. We have bigger challenges in tracking, et cetera. Um, but then there's the human factor side, as you're saying. Um, you can deal with a certain kind of problems, and then it's also um, a time of some motivation for the people. We did uh, bring uh, AR systems uh, to, to welders, for example. Um, we had a young group of welders and an old group of welders. And uh, the company was doing time measurements, and the old group was using our system was quite slow. And the young group was quite fast. So what you see is it's a kind of some motivation, how you want to do it, and so you, uh, it's, uh, 
an immersive technology also, and it's a technology adoption, and you need to take some people by the hand and bring those technologies to the market. But the adoption then can go quite, uh, quite fast. And also now the old welders group is also using it quite fastly. It's, it's in your mind about them. Also working units, they need to do deal with it. Great, thanks. And so we have about one minute left. Uh, glad to take, I guess we can only get one question in from the audience with the limited time that we have. Does anybody have a question to, for the panel? If you do, we have mics. There we go, sir. Um, you talk about whether it's the industry driven or consumer driven. It's a question of fashion and function. I think that dichotomy loses the whole value of human purpose and analogical reasoning in the workplace. Most all experts work on analogical reasoning, not analytical. And so I see that it's going to be consumer driven because the consumer cares about the consumer in all of its aspects. The industry is so much into function, deals with the purpose, the, the task, and there's a big gap between that. And when does industry start thinking like a consumer? And when do we start working on the user and advancing his skills, which are all new skills now with augmented reality? It's transformed how we perform and looking at new training systems and new human function with the technological capabilities. Where is that development in between the fashion and function? It's, uh, what you're saying is uh, quite correct. The, the industry cares more about uh, function currently as a consumer mayor about, uh, um, um, about gain, it needs to be nice and uh, fashion. But at the end, because augmented reality is so immersive, it really is around you. It's not just a little bit. It's more complex than uh, building an iPhone, basically. And to make it happen, so that we're going to use it in the industry and on the consumer side, we need to take both needs yeah, the consumer wants, uh, wants also function. He doesn't want to have uh, only fancy fashion and stuff. And also the industry guys, as they are, at the on, uh, other side, they are consumers. And they want to, um, you need to look at both sides and take, consider the complexity of the users. And only if you, if you really look at both and bring both things together and join it, then we can make it successfully. Peter, any last thoughts? Yeah, I, I would agree to a certain extent. Uh, industry, but, but I would say the, the people that make those glasses should take a uh, wearer-centric perspective. Wearer being an, an operator, or be it a consumer on a bike, or uh, walking, whatever. But a, a wearer-centric perspective is crucial. And whether that is to do a job or to, uh, to play sports, uh, that can be different, but it needs to be wearer-centric. Okay. Well, our time is up here this morning. Uh, you know, thanks to Bjorn and Peter, uh, and thanks you, thank you to all of you for attending our session this morning. And uh, we will be around all day if you have any other thoughts and questions that you'd like to bring up with us on smart glass adoption. So thank you. Thank you.